And good afternoon. Can you hear me up the back? No, maybe. Uh, g'day guys, my name's uh, Edward Farrell, I also go by the name of Faz, and uh, my talk uh, is on reusing breach data from both an offensive standpoint, but also uh, just uh, how we can also employ it uh, from a, a defensive standpoint. Just out of curiosity, how many people here are at pen testers or bug bounty hunters or, or what have you? Cool. Defenders, blue teams. Oh, excellent. So there's, there's a good mix, well, actually probably more blue than red um, out here. So just to give you a bit of background uh, about myself, so I've been working in the security space now for, uh, for eight years, mostly on the, the offensive side. Uh, I often find myself diving between uh, both, uh, both offense and, uh, and defense, but mostly from the, the side of uh, you know, thinking through how would you as a threat actor or, or a threat uh, do some sort of harm to an organisation. So I, I now run my own team uh, in Sydney. Uh, I have uh, two staff, a couple of uh, support folk, and uh, I, I am looking at hiring sometime in the next 12 months, so uh, if you're interested, do, do come up and say good day. Uh, but most of the work we, we do works on uh, the, the pen testing space, but it, it kind of uh, has, uh, as I've found out over the last two and a half, three years, We've found ourselves stepping back a lot further in terms of, uh, as opposed to just doing a simple test or a simple VA, understanding what a lot of this, uh, understanding a lot of what the, the actual threat means to the company or even coming back and rethinking through and, and going through, well, what's actually going to make this uh, someone's worst day? So uh, off the back of that, we've been doing a, a number of interesting uh, pieces of research around the space, especially around... Uh, things like uh, like reconnaissance and understanding uh, our customers, uh, but also things around uh, events that have been taking place, such as data breaches. Uh, on top of this, I also lecture uh, at UNSW Canberra uh, as well, um, mostly in uh, in the wireless security space uh, and uh, Internet of Things, um, which. Uh, uh, if you're actually looking at going to university next year, we we will have Faraday cages there, so. Happy days. Uh, so what are data breaches? Uh, this is uh, the definition. I'm pretty sure I pulled it from Wikipedia or chopped and changed it. Chopped and changed it. But uh, a data breach is an incident where uh, sensitive, protected, or confidential data has been viewed, stolen, unauthorised. Uh, it can be things like personal health information, um, anything personally identifiable, trade secrets, uh, or intellectual property. Um, now, for the context of this talk, the thing where we are looking at is really heavily going to be around things such as usernames and passwords, uh, but there's other uh, pieces of data there as well that uh, that's fairly interesting. And, um, and so just to, to go through it, there's been some form of uh, disclosure or, or occasional instances of disclosure since about 2005. So uh, doing a bit of research on this, the, the first uh, instance of this, I believe, was uh, AOL back in about... Five, where it was actually, yep, this event took place. Um, we've lost a, a heap of data. But we then started seeing, especially with the rise of LulzSec in 2010, uh, we started seeing um, a lot more significant uh, occurrences of this taking place. They also started to become quite public and uh, are now almost uh, commonplace. So we've already had this week uh, the whole piece on, uh, on Uber uh, losing 57 million records. And, if you have a look at the screenshot on, yes, that's on your left. Uh, sorry, my left, shit, I just flew in uh, last night. So if you have a look uh, at the screenshot uh, on your right, um, you'll see uh, an image from uh, informationisbeautiful.net where uh, since about 2010 we've seen not only the, the volume of uh, these breaches increase, but we've also seen the size of the content uh, that's been disclosed uh, increasing. Uh, as well. Now what's also uh, been a, another piece that's been quite peculiar about these breaches is that knowledge of their events uh, will uh, become uh, public long after the actual breach has taken place. So LinkedIn for example, and I'll, I'll reference LinkedIn here uh, a lot just because from a, a pen tester and, uh, and offensive security standpoint it's been an awesome breach to use. Um, that occurred in 2012 but we didn't know anything about it until 
uh, the beginning of 2016. So what's some of the content uh, we see in breaches such as this? So emails, phone numbers, and other contact information is, is what's there, and that's going to be the personally identifiable piece of associating an individual uh, with that set of data. We'll also start seeing things such as home address and contact details uh, in there a lot. But what's been really peculiar is we've now started to see a reduction in the number of, uh, of credit cards uh, that have, uh, have been uh, publicly disclosed. Uh, now, if you go back to, say, the Stratfor breach in 2010, uh, credit cards were, were in there a, a lot. But a, a lot of people have now actually started to cotton on of, hey, I, I probably shouldn't hold that sort of information anymore, or it's actually cheaper to, to make it someone else's problem and, and outsource it. Things such as correspondence, email addresses, SMSs, uh, or internal messaging systems uh, within an application may also be present, and that in itself may contain data, but that usually takes a bit of time to, to analyse. And every now and then we'll things, see things such as scanned ID, uh, IDs, uh, IP addresses from points of origin, uh, or some sort of other uh, context-specific uh, material. So where's my interest in, and what have been some of my early observations um, for this? So I, I originally started diving into this just because I, I really started uh, having a bit of interest in some of the data that was out there. Uh, and um, my, probably the first instance of this was a breach against the ABC in Australia back in 2013. Going through it, you could actually start to uh, not only identify uh, some of the passwords uh, that were there being associated with uh, well-known individuals, but uh, peculiarly, I started coming across that, hey, um, the two or three admin hashes that were in the system uh, were, in fact, uh, being sought for, um, uh, for cracking on a, uh, on a Russian forum, uh, and it was evident that the site had actually been breached uh, long before. So off the back of just this little bit of data, it's like, hey, we've actually seen uh, that someone probably beat, um, uh, beat Anonymous or whoever made claims to the hack about a year or two prior to it. Other interesting ones I've been doing as well have been uh, around the Ashley Madison breach of, uh, um, uh, from about two years ago. So things I've actually enjoyed looking at uh, have been... Um, uh, have been uh, along the lines of correlating uh, the addresses uh, within Sydney and socioeconomic status. So, for example, uh, there were more fake accounts set up uh, on the lower North Shore of Sydney uh, than there were in, say, Western Sydney. Uh, it's also been interesting correlating uh, that data with your own uh, personal um, uh, with your own uh, personal uh, uh, email addresses and. and email addresses of people that you know. That's, um, that's curious to see who actually use their, their real address. Um, uh, but the, the best one for me so far has actually probably been uh, around the LinkedIn breach, more so because that's what most people in business uh, have been using. Uh, it's also been fairly accessible, and there's always, for us, there's always actually been an account uh, that we've been able to find. But just as a general observation, probably the, the, more, the most significant disclosure I've uh, I believe that was out there, was probably around Stratfor, and that was more to do with the people Stratfor uh, had as their clients uh, and the, the nature of uh, that breach and, and its outcome. Probably the, the larger one uh, of significance uh, I've found was around uh, Yahoo, but I, I'll, I'll always come back. LinkedIn uh, has, for a very long time, been very useful for uh, identifying passwords and uh, identifying password behaviours, and I'll show that in a second. Probably the, the most menacing one has, in fact, been the been adult websites. So, um, yeah, just Ashley Madison is uh, has a really rich uh, bit of data of that. That really points to some interesting uh, some interesting behaviours by by a number of individuals. So. What actually really spurred my interest uh, was, in fact, uh, my own password uh, being in the LinkedIn breach and uh, being uh, quite easy to, to crack. So this, this was my password uh, before anyone wants to go and try and use it. Um, I, don't, I actually went through every service I'd used in uh, the five or ten years uh, prior to this event to verify that I was uh, no, longer, uh, no longer using it. Um, I think I found about two or three instances where I still was, and this is kind of what sparked my interest. Well, if 
if I'm doing this, then surely someone's probably still doing this uh, elsewhere, uh, say within their organisation uh, or within um, other services uh, that they use uh, as a part of their business. So what's some of the stuff that can be relevant to us when we're doing, say, a, a business-related uh, pen test? So IP addresses uh, and cor correlation with cor corporate proxies. So uh, Ashley Madison, I'll come back to Ashley Madison as the example there. Uh, you're, it, it's actually quite easy to start pulling out. So he was a, in one case we found so the one we actually used for co correlating corporate proxies was in fact uh, the proxy for the Australian Parliament House, where you could actually start going through and identifying uh, not only IP address uh, accounts that had been signing in from that IP address, but we were then also able to align it with dates of birth with people that we know are, uh, are in that facility and off the back of that uh, start extrapolating uh, other data about them. Uh, if you're able to start stitching together uh, a number of data sources, you could actually start identifying password sequences or behaviours. So if one target we had a look at uh, had managed to incorporate the word bounty in their password consistently uh, and could simply just increment or decrement that number as required. So we can also start extrapolating a little bit of data on human and behavioural analysis, such as login times, if it's there. But a lot of that's going to be dependent uh, on the sort of information you have. Uh, the other one as well is around people who are maintaining the same password uh, across multiple sites, uh, which is something that we consistently uh, see, and those will typically be our first targets. Uh, but also the other one as well is use of this data in things such as blackmail uh, or corporate espionage or, or financial gain and I'll talk about an incident we dealt with a little early this year uh, on that but uh, things like adult uh, websites are incredibly powerful when you need to actually say that yes this person has been using this website we can then also correlate their reuse of the LinkedIn, their LinkedIn password with their Ashley Madison password and there's no way they can deny uh, that they've been on these systems. So what are some of the issues with, uh, with maintaining this sort of data? So I'll preface this with saying, look, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but at the end of the day, you're gaining and, and making use of information uh, that has been thieved at some point uh, in time, and it's been disclosed by someone, and it's, it's, it's somewhere out in the open. But I always come back and say, well, how does this differ from, um, uh, from Eternal Blue or or WannaCry has eventually evolved into in that, uh, someone was effectively able to uh, use the code that was uh, provided to create uh, the Eternal Blue ex exploit and, and publicly use it. Do we also make use of that exact same exposure uh, from a defensive standpoint and understand how this works, uh, how we're going to patch it, and then off the back of that, use it in a defensive uh, in a defensive mechanism. So it's been one of these peculiarities of, yep, I have data that uh, has been stolen and uh, has been disclosed, but for me, I always come back to this whole, well, we're, we're using it from a defensive standpoint of uh, we're trying to help organisations not uh, reuse, uh, well, we're trying to help individuals within an organisation not reuse their passwords. And this kind of leads to my next point. We've already seen indicators that suggest this is already in use. So, uh, does, uh, so if anyone uh, has any visibility on, um, uh, on, either, uh, on uh, any points that are being used for, for logins, if they've seen any credential, has anyone seen any credential stuffing attacks in the last 12 months coming through uh, any logins anyway? Yep. Yep, so down the back there. Are, and this, this also came a discussion point with a colleague of mine who uh, runs an Australian firm called Casada, where they uh, were using some of the data that we had in fact uh, gathered on uh, email addresses relating to one of their customers, the back of which they were saying, well, we we're able to correlate this with the LinkedIn breach. Someone appears to be consistently using uh, that breach data in order to uh, gain access uh, to uh, to uh, to email accounts, uh, 
And uh, interestingly enough, Sam and I were talking about this last week, uh, and he was saying, well, we're already starting to see it again, and it's typically occurring off uh, several specific sites. But funnily enough, in August 2017, uh, my team and I got uh, called in uh, to, a, uh, to an incident response. Uh, this was by a couple of lawyers based uh, in Brisbane uh, who were trying to understand how exactly this uh, attack had occurred on one of their customers. So these guys were, um, were an Australian supplier that resold goods uh, in Australia. And they had this uh, interesting piece of correspondence from one of their US suppliers. Uh, so the US supplier used uh, Office 365. Uh, they did have two-factor auth enabled. Uh, and they were trying to establish how uh, one of their account managers' accounts had, in fact, been compromised. And now, there was no evidence of a social engineering attack. There was no indication uh, that there was any uh, targeted attacks on that individual's local machine. But uh, I guess for us, this was a case of, well, the, the simplest uh, explanation is often uh, the, the correct one. And uh, we said, hey, well, look, we've got all this breach data. You know, what, what's this individual's email address off the back of which you were able to say, well, uh, is this your password? Turns out it, it was. Uh, but what was peculiar about that whole interaction uh, wasn't so much the technical sophistication that had taken place. It was, uh, I would say, fairly operationally sophisticated in that uh, the correspondence that was maintained uh, was very specific. The language that was used uh, was consistent with uh, the, uh, the uh, victim's actual uh, method of talking via email. Uh, and it... it turned into a, hey, we need you to update your payment details to send us a quarter of a million dollars to our new corporate bank account uh, in Hong Kong. So with very little sophistication, uh, this threat actor was able to impersonate someone, gain access to their account, uh, and uh, walk away with about a quarter of a million uh, dollars Australian. So in terms of how we uh, get the, the data that we use for this breach, uh, uh, correction, in terms of how we get uh, this breach data and uh, organise it, um, we try and opt, so my team and I try and uh, look for what's publicly uh, available. We, there's uh, several sources, and if you'd like, I'm happy to provide the, the links to uh, some publicly uh, available sources uh, for this data. Um, but the reason why we go for that public data is, one, it, it means that we're not actually trading in, in uh, information it, or we're not helping people profit from it. Uh, but it's also, this is the information that is out there and it's probably the information that's going to be getting used. Now, in terms of verifying authenticity, uh, this is kind of a, a, a curious one. I, I think for the, the most part, uh, and I was asking this question uh, myself about two or three days ago of how authentic is some of the data sets we have. And um, in one sense, it's kind of relevant because we want it to actually store information that's going to be relevant for us. But uh, in another sense, um, it's kind of one of those things that we've just got to say, well, we, we, we're not too fussed uh, at this stage, but it would be curious to sort of uh, over time increase the the verification that what we have is true and accurate and is actually a, a relevant risk. Now, when it comes to managing uh, some of the large data sets that we, we do have, when we, we're doing this as a proof of concept, we, we're just taking the raw data and just graphing it, um, which uh, took a lot of time. So over time, we've uh, built out a, uh, a database that we have. We've got a simple API that plugs into a couple of other services that we're, uh, we're getting up and running. Uh, but this... Um, uh, that takes a little bit of time to, uh, to evolve. And right now in its current form, we're just using a very simple uh, database structure with usernames, passwords, and other interesting data that we have uh, against individuals. So when it comes for our uh, attack sequence, uh, a lot of this is you know, pretty common sort of pen testing stuff in that uh, we try and understand who uh, the, the organisation is first, and we try and enumerate uh, everything associated with them. So things such as web applications, how they're authenticating, what's the network infrastructure they have in place, 
Cloud-based assets is another interesting one that I, I think is something that we overlook uh, from both a, an attack and defence uh, standpoint. Off the back of this, we then have to start mapping out uh, social interactions and uh, individual um, and individual personalities. Uh, we also tend to identify key players that interest us based on the target we're researching. So whether it's uh, C-level uh, executives or uh, people who are responsible for maintaining the accounts, we'll go to a greater level of detail in understanding who they are, what their personal email addresses are, uh, and uh, try and establish um, as much as we can off the back of the, the sort of breach data that we typically maintain uh, against those individuals. And this kind of leads a bit more uh, into into that, uh, from that technical domain into that sort of personal domain of uh, getting an understanding of uh, of both the staff, but also uh, evaluating third parties. So if you had a look uh, previously, the talk uh, that I was delivering, uh, sorry, the instant response that my team and I had dealt with uh, was around that third party interaction on off the back of compromising one individual uh, within a supplier, uh, the individuals that were looking to get a quarter million dollars out of Australian company uh, were uh, able to map out, understand those interactions and exploit them. Uh, username structures are also another interesting one to, uh, to understand and, and they're quite important when it comes to, to undertaking an attack. Same, same with uh, email addresses. You also heard me before talking about how uh, breach data will actually be quite dated. So if you think about uh, your average uh, Australian, they typically move companies every two to three years. So doing a simple domain search uh, on your target organisation may not in fact be enough. And so if you're starting to map out LinkedIn profiles uh, that are associated with your target company, you then need to step back a little bit and start mapping out those individuals uh, as well. So at the back of that, we'll usually come up with an attack, sur an attack surface that looks a lot like this. So you'll usually have an ex a, a corporate environment that, uh, that you'll probably want to be looking at, things like Citrix applications, a, a VPN. Random applications are always awesome on a, on a company's network, usually because someone's created them separate from uh, the, the target company, but also because um, they're, they're usually not well maintained and they have their own uh, their own place for authentication. Uh, as a service platforms, uh, as I said before, are, are also really uh, peculiar targets. Now, this is uh, going from, let me get this right, going from left to right, uh, we start to fall into these grey areas of well, what can we target and what is legitimate for us to, uh, to exploit. Even though when we get to the, the right hand side and we're looking at individual and personal accounts, um, Targeting these will most certainly be out of scope uh, because uh, when you are engaged in a penetration test or a, uh, any sort of red teaming for a, a business, exploiting those personal accounts is definitely beyond your scope. But then there's this grey area of, well, are these as a service platforms uh, owned by the business or uh, are they owned by, uh, by the platform provider? But given that a lot of uh, a lot of companies nowadays don't maintain uh, their own infrastructure to maintain the maintain these platforms, um, you know, this is where the business is actually going to be getting done. So when we start conducting uh, attacks against uh, platforms such as this, things we start looking at are: um, do we have to change the username? Uh, do we then also have to validate uh, if the uh, the username is correct or not? if we can log in via just a simple password. Um, and then off the back of this, we'll have things like just some direct password guessing against, uh, against uh, the known password or a historical password uh, and uh, that username. And typically we'll have, uh, say, the last company we tested, I think we had about 120 odd uh, possible uh, accounts, we were just testing simple username and password combinations based on the users that we were able to map out and identify across about three or four different applications. We then have some more targeted password guessing, so we started looking at uh, 
uh, C-level executives uh, who had multiple accounts uh, from existing breaches, any different variations of their passwords, such as incrementing numbers, uh, changing uh, seasons, uh, so on and so forth. And then layering in a bit of automation uh, with this is actually, to be honest, this is still something that we're working through, mostly because uh, a lot of it kind of requires that human interaction and that human analysis of understanding um, how an individual behaves and what their thoughts are uh, on, uh, on what their password is or, or how they're going to have a password structure. So just out of curiosity, how, how successful do you think my team and I have been on those sort of attacks? Who reckons more than 50%? Yeah. Yep, so uh, who, who reckons probably only every now and then? No. Nah. Yep, so uh, to be honest, we'll probably only get, say, out of a target list of 120, um, and this is based off our, our last engagement, off a target list of 120 uh, individual accounts we had enumerated, we only had access to two or three accounts, uh, which, look, is actually fairly low, but how, how often do you reckon we need to be successful? Yeah, just once. So uh, off the back of gaining access to one of these accounts, the post-exploitation scenarios are, uh, are going to be dependent on what you've compromised and what that means. So. Uh, for the most part, it's uh, and for most of our uh, uh, for most of our um, our activities, the thing that our customers are concerned about are the unauthorized access or modification of information. So, being able to gain access is probably the, the more significant uh, piece we we have there in um, uh, in our attacks is is that whole piece on espionage. Uh, so, being able to go through acquired data, pillage it modify it, change it, uh, update data, and update things is uh, usually the, the more significant attack. Vector. But once again, this will always come back to what, what are you trying to demonstrate and what are you trying to get out of it? Uh, there will be some customers where we, we actually have to hold on any post-exploitation scenarios for either a, a, a financial means or because um, the executives are, are quite sensitive about the activities you're taking, especially if you're in their email inbox. We, we then have these assumed levels of trust, which leads into a, a suite of social engineering attacks. So if you have access to someone's email inbox uh, and there's no expectation uh, that someone can, can perform that, there's all of a sudden uh, this assumption that if you are within the environment, you're, you're secure. And, and from a social standpoint, it becomes quite easy to social engineer uh, the, the targets you're looking at. Finally, there's this whole piece on persistence. You, you heard me talk about the, uh, the incident response we had before. We were looking at several weeks of someone maintaining access uh, to that one email account, developing their understanding before they actually conducted uh, any sort of uh, attacks. And this wasn't, I, I, as I said before, this wasn't a technically sophisticated attack. It was, we're in the inbox, we're learning their patterns of life, we're understanding how and who they interact with, and how that could be used on our end for, for an attack. So that's kind of where we look at things from an offensive standpoint, but what about the existing security controls we have in there? So we, we're now talking about all these mandatory, uh, mandatory disclosure laws in Australia, which will come into effect in, in February. In their current incarnation, and, and in some of the activities I've already seen in this space, uh, my observations have been that a lot of it is fairly uh, ineffective in terms of being able to support any follow-on defensive actions. So when we look at um, two-factor authentication, you know, that's going to stop an attack like, uh, like that dead in its tracks. I mean, you'll probably still be able to validate, say, on, on Google, for example, uh, that, um, that the password is in fact valid, but off the back of that, all of a sudden, uh, that user may now have, say, an SMS, hey, give us the, uh, here's your, uh, your second factor of authentication. Password management applications uh, are also fairly uh, effective, uh, as long as they're employed uh, correctly. Um, the whole speed and time of a password reset uh, activity in a non-technical domain is also fairly slow. Uh, and so if all I need is that one little attack uh, that I can exploit uh, 
within 15 minutes. That's going to dislocate the defence and uh, your ability to reset and prepare for, uh, for uh, any follow-on events or say if I've already got access and you've just reset the password, well, I'm just going to maintain that session. These are things that you probably want to conceptualise from a defensive standpoint. Uh, finally, Have I Been Pwned is an awesome uh, source for uh, identifying, yes, if your password uh, was in, in a breach, but I, I think for me the, the thing that really rung home, uh, that really sort of came home for me was when I was starting to identify what data was in these breaches uh, and what did the risk of that data mean for me as an individual. And this is kind of where I talk about how we want to reorientate uh, defence. Let's actually show people what's in, uh, in some of these uh, data sets that other people have out there on them. Um, this is going to be far more effective from a defensive standpoint uh, than saying, have I been pwned, or doing a, a user awareness session, actually saying, hey, is this your password? Uh, are you still using this password anywhere else? Do you want to change your password? Will actually be a far more effective way of capturing uh, other users then uh, here's a social engineering awareness campaign. Sit down and watch this video for the next 20 minutes. And with that in mind, incorporating that sort of data in the process of a user getting enrolled into an organisation of, hey, what were your previous email addresses? OK, cool, don't use any of, the, uh, any of these data sets and uh, probably don't use Ashley Madison using your corporate account. Um, starts to sort of communicate the whole acceptable use policy in a little bit more detail than a 50-page PDF. Uh, relying on things like YubiKeys or two-factor authentication, is, is, you know, that's going to be part and parcel of business. Uh, I think one of the things that's always been a disconnect is understanding the why. And uh, activities such as the ones where uh, you are attempting to break in with some of these password, uh, with uh, existing breach data, uh, is, a, is an important part uh, of that process. Also, relying on a single point of uh, or authentication as well, uh, whether it's OAuth, Active Directory, uh, will also help out because if people are having to maintain 20 or 30 different passwords, uh, as I had about a year or two ago, someone's going to have a different password. Um, sorry, someone's still going to maintain the exact same password they've been using for the last 10 years. As an organisation, being able to understand where all your applications are, what the logins are, uh, how they're authenticating and what those uh, represent uh, from a risk standpoint um, and, and an attack surface uh, will also kind of help with, all right, if there is another big breach, uh, what will this mean for us? Uh, will we'll also kind of help prepare the whole defensive piece. Um, other defensive practices uh, as well within uh, breach data, things like um, uh, like ensuring users aren't using their corporate accounts uh, for signing into the wrong apps, ensuring uh, that you actually have proper filtering policies out there so they're not accessing the wrong locations, and then that being an embarrassment to the, the uh, organisation because your, uh, your proxy IP address is in a site of ill repute. Um, and even how you maintain information uh, as well and understanding what that means uh, will, will also uh, assist greatly in this process. So that's, uh, I guess, a, a very quick overview of, of some of the stuff that my team and I have been playing with uh, from an offensive standpoint and also how we've taken a lot of that data and not just gone, ha-ha, we've owned you, it's employing this information so that defenders can understand uh, what the risks represent to them are. Um, does anyone have any questions uh, on any of the things I've just talked about or? No, oh, where's... If I've got the lights right in me. Nope. Awesome. Guys, look, thanks for, uh, uh, for attending and thanks for coming to B-Sides.